Hey, Patrick. Hey, Michael J. So, first weekend of standard with Guilds of Ravnica in the record books. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely started off with a bang, too. A lot of diversity and uh, a lot of even more just uh, such a different world than the previous one. Oh, yeah. I mean, like, just the pillars of this standard are just completely different than the pillars of the last standard, right? Even though, you know, theoretically, more than half the format is uh, incumbent cards, just everything is shifted, you know, I don't know, 90 degrees or something. Mm. Yeah, I also think it's kind of interesting, the four pillars this time being set up around, uh, I, I think personally, at least from just this week one, that it looks like the four pillars of standard are what is your base color? Is it red? Is it blue? Is it white or is it green? Because it ain't black. Black is a support color uh, for green or for blue. Um, just I think Overgrown Tomb and Watery Grave are <laughs> are uh, clues. But the uh, the amount that it looks like the your base color is really determining which of the cat, you know, what your style of play is. Um, and it's interesting, the four different versions, how much room there is to explore in them, you know, like for instance, the base white decks, I think there's a big difference between, uh, white aggro green, wait, sorry, green, white tokens versus, this Boros Angels deck that Brian Cooper won the classic with. And there were two copies in the top eight. Have you seen this? This, uh, this is the one that it's like, uh, it's basically a mono white deck. It's a mono white deck that splashes lightning strike and defi- uh, deafening clarion. So like the main deck is literally just, it's total mono white all the way th- up and down, but then four sacred foundry, four cliff top retreat and five mountains to go along with the 12 planes in order to splash lightning strike deafening clarion and then uh having access to not one not two three copies of bane fire in the sideboard this deck is dope i guess there's also the uh, the, the the red white angel aurelia yeah yeah she's a she, you know she's she's kind of sweet too very on theme though this deck has got a ton of angels right it's got resplendent angel at the three and then at the four next to aurelia's there's shalai and then lyra dawnbringer brings it all together right like aurelia and lyra dawnbringer that's kind of a combo they're angel angel oh yeah I, lyra dawnbringer is the try it's the only tribal reward here obviously it's just it just so happens that all four of these angels are dope cards on their own and so lyra dawnbringer as great as she is Wow, is she way better when you are playing with uh, 10 other angels? Absolutely. Yeah, especially, uh, I guess it's not surprising because Lyra is the top of the curve, but all all those angels are like, you know, four into Lyra, right? Um, You know, you can have an angel in play. play Well, and Resplendent Angel. Sure. Actually go turn three, Resplendent Angel, turn four, Chalet or Aurelia, turn five, Lyra Dawnbringer, and you are doing it. Yeah, so the thing that's cool about this deck, I think, is that it's it's not super fast, right? It's not like the green-white tokens deck. Where to say the least, it is not super fast, yeah. It's, it's not coming out on turn one, but it can come out on turn two with the Adanto Vanguard, right? Uh, which is a respectable offensive creature. Uh, but this deck, you know, just set Knight of Grace and sometimes Resplendent Angel aside for a second— but you can, like, theoretically say you're going second, right? Your opponent plays a guy, plays another guy. You played a Danto Vanguard. Turn three, I don't know, he plays, like, two guys as these tokens or something. You can give your Adanto Vanguard indestructible, right? You can pay four life to do that. And then cast Deafening Clarion. In my, in my opinion, I would, I would choose to give my Adanto Vanguard lifelink in this situation. But basically kill all their guys and then swing in, get, get the big life swing also. But the cool thing about it is Deafening Clarion doesn't kill very many of your own guys. Like, it kills Knight of Grace. It kills some Resplendent Angels. But for the most part, your guys live through this. Uh, sometimes. Yeah, yeah, sometimes. Because Resplendent Angels also pretty high on the list of cards that get buffed by Lyra Dawnbringer. Yeah, yeah. I said some Resplendent mentor, Angels die. Oh, yeah, totally. But also, uh, the 
the uh, Aurelia Exemplar of Justice, uh, the Mentor ability loves putting plus one, plus one counters on things like Resplendent Angel. Remember, you can uh, Aurelia itself, so that Aurelia is a four or five, and then you can use the Mentor ability so that it buffs the Resplendent Angel, and now it's out of Deafening Clarion range. Uh, yeah, you can do that. Uh, History of Benalia tokens, they die sometimes to uh, to uh, the Deafening Clarion. I think they often but, would, yeah. But they uh, sometimes don't. And uh, wow, is History of Benalia just so dope with Conclave Tribunal. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's like... Uh... It's like the elves deck from uh, from LSV days, right? Like you just pay yourself right back and cast your next thing for <laughs> for less. It's it's the uh, the heritage druid of it's like, it's of, like of, Court of, of Calling of for angels. angels. Yeah, yeah. And also, obviously, go ahead. Yeah. I was saying this. I think this deck's pretty cool. Definitely. Uh, Remember, Lyra Dawnbringer giving your other angels plus one, plus one, and lifelink is also just unbelievable for for racing. You know what I mean? Like, when your resplendent angel and uh, your Aurelia are both, uh, get it, you know, or Shalai or whatever, if all these things are, are picking up lifelink, oh, boy, that's a... That's... You know, pretty sweet. I, I think that there's probably a fair number of games where you're just like shrug, give my guys life link with deafening clarion attack. Like I, I, I don't know. Like because you know sometimes it's just not, not appropriate to deal three to everything, um, and that that can be a, a valuable racing tool. That's sweet. Uh, it's also worth noting a Johnny adversary of tyrants can buff your uh, knight of the your I mean sorry your wrist one and angel out of the uh, out of the way. Yes. Um, yes. Yes. So, so, what do you think about this deck? I think that the deck is cool. I think that it definitely has, um, you know, it's an intuitive spot in the beginning part of the uh, of the format. I'm not real sure that this is going to be. Uh, it's going to stick around forever. You don't think this one has legs? I'm not sure. Right. So, a lot of the things that this. So, this deck has a good kind of go big aspect to it right like these angels and buffing each other and big bodies that's a that's a very different angle of attack than you know a tokens low go wide strategy right so it's very very different um but the deck is not fast and the deck does not have um it does not have any way to like kind of like regulate its draw right you you're really kind of at the mercy of the top of your library in this deck, aren't you? It reminds me of some of the green-white tap-out decks that Luis Scott Vargas and Paul Chion used to play. You mean before Where, they were amazing at Magic? No, they had already won national championships and oh, stuff. okay. So they were already amazing at Magic. Yeah, yeah. But uh, definitely pre, you know, Pro Tour Top 8s. Um, some more pre Pro Tour Top 8 than others. Uh, the... <laughs> <laughs> uh Boros Angels deck uh has some variety in it though. Well, we just took a look at a much more pure version. Uh what about Jesse Hedman's fourth place list? Wow, was I not necessarily just uh you know thinking that the key was fusing goblins and angels together side by side, but maybe it is, because that does make sense if like the goblins and the angels are the ones mentoring. Oh, man, this deck is ambitious. Yeah, so this one, uh, it's most of the same angels, four Splendid Angel, just three Lyra Dawnbringer instead of four, and just two Chalet instead of three. So two less angels total, but that's to make room for two Siege Gang Commanders. And uh, interestingly, instead of Knight of Grace uh, of being alongside the Danto Vanguard, it's alongside Goblin Instigator. Kind of an interesting little bit of a tokens aspect. But then where, where stuff gets really freaky is that this is the first top-performing Siege Gang Commander deck I've seen 
that also just plays Benalish Marshall. Yeah, yeah, that's that's what I meant. I mean, I don't know. Like WWW is that's ambitious in a two color deck. Um, this one's got not only Mountain but Field of Ruin. Um, well, I guess it's actually, not that bad. That's no, like twenty three white sources. Yeah, and uh, I, I don't I don't think the triple white's the bigger thing. The bigger question to me is four Boros Gilgate, four Clifftop Retreat, four Sacred Foundry, a mountain and a field of ruin. It's not the most red ever for your Siege King Commander. And it's important to note this list is playing four Boros Gilgates instead of zero. So it's not like you can just hand wave how many more land come into play tapped here. Uh, one other kind of interesting twist... Instead of uh, Deafening Clarion, this list is playing... So the Deafening Clarions were replaced by Benalish Marshall. But then the removal mix is just so different. You still have the Conclave Tribunals, but instead of those four Lightning Strikes, there is an eclectic mix of two Justice Strike, which is the new red-white target cre- instant. Target creature deals damage to itself equal to its power. One copy of Lava Coil, you know, the sorcery, one in red, deal four damage to a creature. If it die, exile it. And one copy of Response Resurgence, which you can deal five damage to an attacking or blocking creature for Boros Boros. Or for five, you can play as a sorcery. Creatures you control gain first strike and vigilance, and then you get a second attack phase, you know? Yeah, I think that card is good. I actually think I think so too. All those cards are good. Um, yeah, you know, an eclectic mix is is pretty pretty appropriately placed there uh, by you. I think Justice Strike is cool. Like that's like I like, like Justice Strike. The red, it's like a red terminate. Yeah, it's also a white terminate. Yeah, it's also a white terminate. So uh, just the the this deck. Also- the reason I don't like going so long on Justice Strike, though, just to. I, it's okay. I just I don't like Justice Strike against stuff like Aurelia and Chalet. It's really bad against Aurelia and Chalet, right? Like two five and uh, three four are not going to be killing themselves if you uh, hurl a Justice Strike at them. I might just be crazy, but I kind of would like one Justice Strike, one Lava Coil, and two Response Resurgence. I think Response Resurgence is so sweet. Oh yeah, I don't I don't know how often you play the five. The five casting cost side, but I bet. Oh, I I bet. I I bet a fair bit. First of all, you get to take your removal spell against a control deck and turn it into a a serious threat. Oh, and just kill them with it, right? Like that's an over right now. Right. And second of all, I like uh, get an extra attack step when you've got history of Benalia's plus two plus one to your knights. And remember, Benalish Marshall, also a knight. You know, as well as obviously not a grace, but that's that's not a trivial number of knights to get a bonus. And so if you can get the bonus for two attacks that turn, that's, you know, good on you. That is that is a uh, solid. I just wanted to note uh, a feature of this sideboard, which was in the previous Boros Angels deck that we looked at a second ago, uh, which is those Bane Fires. Right. Um, I think it's like super intuitive. And I think that I would actually if I were to play strategy, like this, probably play four Bane Fires in my sideboard. Because even if you only have one mountain, like Jesse does, it's super easy to go find because you're just going to truck with all of your History of Benalia tokens and all your, you know, Goblin Instigator tokens and Siege Gang Commander tokens. And somebody is going to cast the card, settle the wreckage against you. And then you can search up all kinds of basic lands, including that one mountain. Exactly. And then they are dead. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> they are cooked. They are on fire. They cannot counter it. How's it taste? Banefire is an excellent, excellent measure against uh, Settle of the Wreckage. I think uh, okay. I think this is the format where like all kinds of decks have just got a mountain in their sideboard, and this should just be sideboarding Banefire against the blue white decks. I think that mm, like I don't know. Green black, mountain in the sideboard. Green white Wild. mountain in the sideboard. I Wild. I think I think that that's the way of the future. All that could be sweet. It's it's so easy to get to, right? Yeah. Like so. Here's the thing. He's got to settle the wreckage himself. Yeah, <laughs> he could settle himself. Yeah. Uh, so 
here's the thing that I think is going to be the weirdest, like super weird aspect of this format where I, th- I think that green, white, it just, you know, you know, spoilers in, in my opinion, probably later in this, in this cast, I think green, white's the strongest deck to, to come out of the first week. But I think that one of the things that red, white might have as an advantage over green, white is the point removal is, is, um, you know, quite a bit better than the, the green white point removal such that if you're, if you're in sideboarded games, both decks have access to Shalai, maybe access to four Shalai, right? And, and the green white decks is relying on settle the wreckage against other green white decks and presumably against a red white deck. Uh, and you can't settle the wreckage. Somebody who has Shalai in play. So I don't, you know what I mean? Like there's just going to be yeah. all this material staring across the, the battlefield, each other. Maybe the green white deck will win in the long game because there you can actually activate their Shalai. Like <laughs> that's actually pretty awesome, right? That is really awesome. Yeah, like nobody's attacking. Okay, I got six. Oh boy. <laughs> so speaking of going long, what do you think of Experimental Frenzy X three in the sideboard? So this is one of the reasons why I think that Red White might not be here to stay. I uh, the more I think about it, I think that Experimental Frenzy is going to be the necropotence of this of this format. And I mean that in, like, not just the sense of, like, this is a very necropotence-esque card, but also in the sense that it will inform play patterns and deck design decisions in profound ways, I think, moving forward, just to exploit the card, right? You know how necropotence, like, oh, it's, a, it's an okay card, maybe we'll sideboard it. And then it became, like... No, every eventually everything about your deck was just like I need to play four consults so that I have more necropotences, and I need to play Lake of the Dead to maximize this. And I'm like when Randy won the Pro Tour, he would not only like just like, mulligan to necropotence, but he would he would build his hand so that he could consult for a second necropotence in, in case he lost his first one to a Hymn to Torok. Like I think that Experimental Frenzy is going to become such a pillar of this of this format that decks that are kind of like light on experimental frenzy are going to get toasted by like, this is going to be optimized out. Like it's not, not just fast red decks. Cause I think fast red decks is the way that we're seeing experimental frenzy come out. Now I mean like fast red decks with treasure map, fast red decks with access to field of ruin, fast red decks with um, what's his name? The, the two casting cost red guy that can, he can loot or, or kill. Um, oh wow! Dismisser Mage, what's his name? Uh, yeah, like yeah, the dismissive. Because, yep. like, and I think the card is so necropotence esque because it really just gives you all the card advantage you can possibly want as long as you have untapped land, right? That's that's how necropotence worked, also. But here, you're in a situation where if you have consecutive lands, then you're stuck, right? So I think any of that stuff that can change your top card, like by shuffling with field ruin or looting or um, obviously the jumpstart card, the jumpstart browbeat is going to be an important aspect of that, but like it's, the it's, is, though, man, excuse me. I, like, the thing is, I, I, I guess I just wonder how much do you really want to be looting if you can't play the cards in your hand anyway? There's got to be more efficient ways to do this. Well, I mean, I, answer, it's one way to do it. And I get that you're just talking about resetting the top. Yeah. I think that there's so many like let me give you an example dark dweller oracle in the same set is such a better two drop for this you can pay a colorless and sacrifice a creature exile the top card of your library you may play that card this turn so like being able to use dark dweller oracle it resets just like the other one but like i mean i guess you have to have a lot of, you have to be putting like a goblin deck and a lot of stuff to sacrifice but like the fact that dark dweller oracle lets you actually do it multiple times just seems like you know that there's something oh. there's some- i think that the successful experimental frenzy deck is going to be a lot like the hyper optimized uh necropotence decks in that it will favor just cheap cards that are playable rather than powerful cards right like um you know like there's this different schools right like paul mccabe played eason shade and Sanger Vampire. But those are expensive cards to be playing in a deck that can give you so much card advantage, right? Like you can't you can't optimize how much card advantage your 
um, you're taking with Necropotence because you're spending six mana for an Eastern Shade. You could have spent six mana on three knights instead and then just drawn an extra two cards. I think that just like having a ton of one and two casting cost guys is going to be like just like, I don't know, 20 cards out of that deck because you could just constantly play them off the top while hitting your land drops. And then, um, you know, you're just you're peppering in whatever whatever like powerful gas uh, supplements it with the other 20 cards in your deck. Uh, it, but to that end, I think the, the Oracle probably is very synergistic with playing a bunch of just cheap, pretty good guys. I, I think we might even be able to do even better. You know, I think, like, for instance, how do you feel about just straight red-green? Red-green with Experimental Frenzy. Right. Now, it's tough without stomping around, right? Like maybe the mana's just not good enough. But, like, uh, green often has uh, uh, extra ways to shuffle, you know? And Or, or like, I, look at, like, play, play off the top type stuff. Right. Um, and stuff like Lenore Elf just seems real well po- poised for Experimental Frenzy. Uh, I, th- I think it's a possibility. Um, my, my sense was that maybe Mono Red was the best, not because it was the most powerful, but because you could just consistently play the whatever card was on top of your library. Like, I, 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 my current thesis is whatever's on top of I can cast it, I just want to keep casting things. Uh, what about, like, District Guide, man? I also just, love a district guide, but I think like, I mean, we can we can involve in wilds. We can okay. yeah. talk about some other strategies because there are other good. Now strategies. you got my you got yeah yeah you just wet my appetite though. This experimental frenzy stuff. I mean, you're, you're talking my language with the whole necropones thing, but there's plenty of time for that later. Maybe treasure map is the way. Yeah how how nasty is map in mono red? Oh, that's so sweet. Uh, but yeah, you, you alluded to green, white, you know, and obviously, uh, Eric Schutman was, uh, packing green, white tokens, um, in the, uh, the team open last weekend, uh, finishing first, uh, this list, uh, you know, definitely, definitely token centric Four Sapling Migration and Four Legions Landing, you know, nothing new there. But then four March of the Multitudes and four uh, Flower Flourish for helping pump them. Obviously, History of Benali and uh, Conclave Tribunal we've talked about, but like uh, Venera- Venerated Luxodon, the big breakout. I mean, obviously, everybody expected Amara Soul of the Accord. But uh, what do you think of four Venerated Luxodons? So... I think that it's an important aspect of this deck, which is, like you said, it's so token-centric, right? It comes out on turn one with Legion's Landing. Sacrilegion Migration can potentially come out on turn two. Obviously, it's got an alternate uh, for later. But this deck is very good at just deploying a lot of material, but not very meaningful material sideways. Uh, the Loxodon just gives it another aspect, right? Like, the, the Elephant Cleric itself is a 4-4 creature, Right, but then it also pumps all the guys that are involved in in uh, convoking it. So, like, it it does a bunch of stuff. It gives you a tall threat, like in a deck that is almost all one one creatures, and then separately it turns at least some of your creatures immune to Goblin Chain Whirler. So, um, I think like those two things in concert, just like this card, kind of stands alone in this deck as as just. Get, it's not so different. You're still attacking with a green or a white creature, but uh, but kind of like changes the the tenor of uh, of what the threats look like. I think this is the white uh, the white uh, verderous gear hulk. Like yeah, uh, yeah. It's it now if you if you can line everything up, you get nine nine of stats instead of eight eight, but. Uh, you miss out on all those attacks and you're like, oh no, I really wanted all those attacks and that's fair. And I do think that the Gear Hulk is a little bit better. But you also spend zero mana instead of five. And I think that the difference between zero mana and five is so much. So uh, I'm a big fan of this one, you know. Yeah, I'm, this, this card is solid. Uh, what do you think of, uh, you know, the... Uh, Tristani Discordant. Uh, I mean, I think the card is could be cool. Um, 
it seems like kind of the most romantic card in the deck, right? It, I don't know. It, it has a lot of relevant text on it. Like, you know, it's buffing guys, it's generating card advantage. Uh, but I think it's like worse than venerated Loxanon at the five in terms of, you know, it's impact to the team. It's clearly a worse body. Um, you know, you get a little, it's, it's not so insignificant, right? Like, so theoretically for five mana, you're getting what, uh, one, two, three, five, five, yeah, five power, and then across three bodies. That's solid. And, like, if you have any other tokens... Well, that's say, yeah, I was going to say, that's to say nothing of how much it's anthemming your other guys. Yeah, it, it's it's not... It's, I'm not trying to diss it and say it's bad. I'm just saying, like, it's it's kind of really romantic. It's like, I don't yeah. know, man. I, I think you're being a little hard on it. Can, compare this card to Regal Caracal. There's a lot of similarities. Yeah, I mean, Regal Caracal had a very specific job and Triscani Discordant doesn't do that job. Right? Like Real Caracal's job was to was to create Delta in life in life points uh against Well the soldiers here have life point. Yeah, but I I, I mean Dude, I don't plus, know plus at the beginning of your end step each player gains control of all creatures they own. Yeah. Like um, if you play against a, if you play against a Thief of Sanity any of that stuff that draws cards off the top of your deck, it's kind of kind of nice to take that stuff back. Uh, the Taker. What about the Taker? Is yeah. The, the Taker's ultimate enemy. Um, yeah, I think it's probably a pretty good card. I, I just think, like, it, it seems, like, less impactful it. to me than, yeah. than the Venerated Loxon. And of the other big cards, right, like, March of the Multitudes is, like, awesome. Right. It's the the like the top end of how good that card is, is like double, you know, and I don't know. I, I think this card's fine. It's just the least exciting to me. And, you know, Eric played four copies of Venerated Loxodon and two copies of Tristani Discord. And despite the fact that they're both the five. Well, the Loxodon is not a five. It's not really on. a five, right? Sometimes he's, he's zero. He's, yeah, he's not a five. But yeah, I, I think that. I think you actually hit the nail on the head with the whole uh, this guy being kind of romantic. That's exactly the type of card that you always want to put in the first draft and has a high percentage chance of not panning out. Um, so we'll have to we'll have to see there. I could imagine it being right to play some. It's you, you want to play some fives because like you have all these things to do at six with sapling migration getting kicked or. The uh, the the flourish of flower flourish or Shalai's activated ability, so you do need to have something to do on five. Yeah, um, I think I think this card is fine. I just it's just the least exciting to me. Uh, but what is super exciting to me uh, is March of the Multitudes, and then immediately marching again using the March of the Multitudes to convoke. You think that's going to come up a lot? Yeah. That's the the combo, and you just untap and kill them. Yeah, well, especially you untap and flourish and kill them. That's that's sure. some some solid Magic the Gathering. But again, I think like a big big thing about this format is going to be two go wide creature strategies, whether it's Boros or Selesnya, <laughs> with Shalai in play, unable to uh, hit no the other wreckage. Guy, settle settle the wreckage. It's I I think it, it might. My weak one opinion, green-white is the most powerful strategy, best-performing deck, uh, and it's so intuitively strong. Well, the numbers the numbers didn't really back up green-white the best, did it? Well, I don't know. It, for, I just... Yeah, because... Cursor, oh, looked, it's, it's up against itself in the finals of the, of the big event. Yeah, but only three total. Like, uh, I think if you, if you look down, I mean, there were a couple people who did really well, and it might be the best. Maybe next week, we'll see next week where the, where the direction goes. By far, the two most successful strategies in terms of putting people into the top 16s are uh, Mono Red and Blue Control. Mono Red, first place in terms of just like a third of the top. Uh, and, and this is a Mono Red that's definitely... Um, wizard based you know like a lot of there's a variety of ways people do it but people do like dealing three damage with wizards lightning you know 
I mean, the the thing that I was really just kind of dumbfounded by when I was going over the lists this week was how the mono red, like small creature wizards deck seemed to me like the brainiest deck. Like you don't think of like a red creature deck as being like this cerebral thing. I mean, like every, every aspect of this deck, I'm, I'm looking at Max McFetty's deck for a second, the champ. Um, I'm looking at this deck, like, every aspect of this deck, like, builds on the other aspects of the deck, right? Like, the cheap casting costs work with Experimental Frenzy. The, the jumpstart on Risk Factor works with Experimental Frenzy. The presence of these cheap wizards, like Viachino Pyromancer and Fanatical Firebrand, work with Wizards Lightning. You know, like, all those things are, are just building advantage on top of advantage. And the reality is, most of these are pretty good cards going on. Yeah, uh, and in particular, Wizards, I mean, sorry, Risk Factor is kind of an interesting, uh, among good cards going on, it's kind of an interesting debate, an interesting question. Curious your thoughts on two Risk Factor instead of, like, say, zero or four. I would play four Risk Factor. Uh, I think that card is awesome, and I think it is awesome in particular in a deck with this, this cheap of creatures. So... When you're playing Risk Factor, you got to assume the first Risk Factor does four, right? Like, nobody's letting you draw on the first Risk Factor, are they? Not normally. I mean, unless you're at three or something, right? Like, then, then I guess they, you got to let them draw. Because the problem is you can't fuel their next, next Risk Factor for free. And if you, like, let them draw three, they're just going to play three cards because all their guys are, like, one and two. So, um, you know, it's dealing four. Presumably... You came out fast with firebrands and lava runners and pyromancers, etc. So you're just really chipping away at their life. And then plus, I think Risk Factor is awesome with Experimental Frenzy. So I just want to draw a bunch so that I can, so I can jumpstart them and, and keep my Frenzy going. Oh, yeah. I think it's so great when you have Experimental Frenzy and you can actually just put to use the cards in your hand. They're sitting doing nothing. You can actually just power them up by... You can discard them to cast Risk Frenzies from your graveyard. And in fact, you could even discard a Risk Frenzy from your hand. Sorry, a Risk Factor from your hand to uh, play another Risk Factor from your graveyard. So you can just like keep it going. Oh, that's awesome. And then uh, Risk Factor is so dope with Runaway Steamkin. When you... Uh, you get a plus and plus one counter for each red spell you play up until the third... And so Risk Factor counts as two. You get one on the way in, one on the way out. And Runaway Steam can conveniently give you access to three mana at will whenever if you just pull the counters off, which is perfect for casting another Risk Factor and then keeping the party going. Man, Runaway Steamkin, if it's in play and it's not on your side of the table, kill it. That's, yeah. <laughs> that's my it recommendation. so good to me. Kill it. so good. To so, death. So. I mean, it's just like a 4-4 four, four for two, right? Like, it doesn't cost any more mana to make it huge. So, yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan of, of Max's style of red. I think that, uh, in fact, he could go even further and get more risk factors and experiment uh, experimental frenzies in. Um, I, I just like that sort of direction so much better than... Uh, well, I, I like Experimental Frenzy better than uh, The Flame of Keld. You know, like, fourth place oh. makes... Up. No, no. Flame Keld... Come I, on. Flame Keld is... is it's so it's last... So format. last format. I do like his four risk factors, though. Of course. And then, obviously, four Runaway Steamkin. That card is just so the truth. Yeah, I, I think that these uh, straight red strategies are... I mean... I, this deck is probably great anyway, right? I mean, even if we don't like Flame of Keld as much as Experimental Frenzy, the thing that... Well, he's got the Frenzy in the sideboard. Yeah, I mean, he, he does. He does have it. I, I think it's weird, like, the, the very, very low land counts that a lot of them are playing in the main deck, and then they're siding, in some cases, multiple mountains. Yeah, but that's, that's relatively standard. The biggest question is, is there any chance that you want a different land instead for that extra land when you want to bring the count up? I think that they're just counting on really wanting to chain Whirler, you know? Yeah, I agree, but I think that there's probably some value to Field of Ruin in some builds, uh, both because 
uh, it, it's a card sure. that lets you change the top of your library uh, for Experimental Frenzy. And then separately, That's a good point. there are actually just things you might want to have to blow up. Yep. And I think you're when you're slowing down and uh, increasing your range base anyway, it's kind of nice to have a, a little bit of assurance, a little bit of flood insurance so that you can put your land to good purpose if you draw a little too much. And uh, if you're adding that extra land, it's more likely that you're playing in a matchup where Field of Ruin would be good anyway. Uh, what do you think about the omission of uh, mentor guys like uh, uh, Richard Nixon finishing uh, top eight with a mono red deck that has Goblin, Banneret, and Legion Warboss? You know, he's got uh, no, he's got none of the the Steamkin, but Goblin, Banneret, and Legion Warboss. <laughs> Hot or not? I have a hard time believing that. I mean, first of all, I think Legion War Boss is good. In particular, if you're going to play a Flame of the Keld deck, um, I think that there's some value there. Uh, but, I mean, I have a hard time believing that it's better to play without Steamkin. Yeah, I like the Steamkin. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know about these frenzies in the sideboard. I'm, I'm over it. Like that, that's you just want to make deck. Yeah, I, I, was, I was frenzy in the sideboard. Mean it or don't mean it? Mean it? I mean, I mean it like four X in the main deck. I I think this card is crazy good. Like yeah. it's I, it, the thing that I think is going to be in it really, really compelling. Kind of how do you approach operationally playing the game? Is what turn you play Experimental Frenzy, right? Like if you tap out for Experimental Frenzy on turn four, it's not that good, right? You're not getting any value. You're just now you're just stuck. But if you play it, even if you tap out on turn five and you don't have a, a fifth land, right, you have the opportunity to look at your top card and then maybe play a land, uh, play a land off the top. And then maybe there's a one drop on top there, right? Like the difference between tapping out on turn four and tapping out on turn five for this card are, it's, it's tremendous. Um, so, True. like, I don't know. I'm, I'm sure it's right to tap out on turn four sometimes. But I think, like, often if you're tapping out on turn four for this, you're just stranding, like, two or three spells, Right, you're going to have those, you know, and they're never going to do anything except maybe discard them to risk factor. I also just don't think I, I, I would want to get away from Fanatical Firebrand. I actually like that guy quite a bit. You know, like the whole Goblin Banneret instead of Fanatical Firebrand, I'm not buying. Oh, I, I could not agree with you more. Separately, I mean, Firebrand is so useful in an Experimental Frenzy deck. Oh, yeah. Yeah. What do you think about Rekindling Phoenix, 3X on the sideboard? Do you think this card is even... Should, not that it's unplayable, right? But do you think it should... Yeah, I think it's good. Yeah, I think you should play it. I just... I like it better in the sideboard than the main. I like Experimental Frenzy as the main deck. I don't want to play too many fours. I'd rather just start with... The top of my curve is just uh, three or four Experimental Frenzies. And then uh, I've got some Rekindling Phoenixes in the sideboard for when I'm slowing down against uh, Attrition decks. I mean, the card is so outstanding. Uh, removal decks. Decks that don't have, you know, specifically exile-based removal, right? Oh, yeah. Yep. I, I do think that it's meaningfully worse than it was. Uh, there's just a lot of things that outclass it. But... You know, it had room to give. I mean, yeah. I, it was such a dominant card when it was good. Yeah. Um, so uh, the blue control decks. So blue decks I thought were super interesting this week. It was just uh, so almost a quarter of the top table field. But it was split between so many different decks. First of all, every combination of blue-black. You know, blue, black, blue, black, white, blue, black, green, blue, black, red, all that. And there's also Jeskai and Mono Blue. How sick, right? That's so many different blue decks. And they actually play out a variety of different ways. Like the uh, the Jeskai deck is a little bit more the, you know, like you would imagine with like Teferi and you're kind of just playing all counter spells. Uh, getting a lot of value out of like Chemister's Insight as the new uh, Glimmer Genius. Um, and then, uh, you know, your primary advantage over just being a an Is It deck is obviously Teferi. 
and to a lesser degree, you know, stuff like Deafening Clarion if you want it. But your advantage over blue-white is that you might as well play red. The It's not like there's any blue-white dual lands, and if you play red, you get to take advantage of lots of sweet dual lands. And what's more, you get access to uh, that, that Deafening Clarion and Ral is it Viceroy. Plus a little burn if you want, you know, whatever. A couple of lightning strikes to the face. Uh, you could, definitely. Um, I think p- there are two basically different uh, kind of families of this just guy sort of approach. One is a little bit more pure control. You know, you win with four Teferis and one Rao as a backup victory condition. Like and a Blair Splats deck? Yeah, exactly. You just put all removal and card draw. And then the other way, you can incorporate the Niv Mizzet Crackling, you know, our, our preview card, Crackling Drake, along with Niv Mizzet Perun, and get a little bit more tap out, a little bit more proactive. In any case, you get to take advantage of Ionize. And in particular, I wanted to point out um, well, uh, Taren Huck has a 2 2 split of Ionize and uh, Sinister Sabotage. Uh, Blair Splat actually just straight for Ionize, zero Sinister Sabotage. I would be surprised if that continues, you know, as the industry standard moving on. Uh, oh, see, I, I actually thought it was pretty smart. Uh, Blair Splat's list, four Steam Vents, four Glacial Fortress, one Sulphur Falls, four Island. He only has 13 blue sources. It's so nice that this list doesn't have to... This is actually a red-white board control deck that splashes blue for four Teferi, uh, two Chemister's Insight, and a few one-mana counterspells, like, or one blue counterspells, like one Disdainful Stroke, two Essence Scatter, uh, and then uh, four Ionize. I guess he also has one Expansion Expulsion, but Explosion, but like that's super late game. My point is, I think that you could reimagine the mana base a little differently, but if you want to take advantage of just how untapped where Splat's mana base is, then I think it's good having uh, Ionize instead of Sinister Sabotage. I can respect that. Because if you don't, if you go the other way, I mean, if you look like, for instance, Taron Huck, who had the 2-2 split, he's got four Sulphur Falls, four Steam Vents, four Sacred Foundries, four Clifftop Retreats. Right. So he's and then two mountains. So he's actually got 18 red sources, but then his blue, four sulfur falls, four sacred found I'm sorry, four glacial fortress, four steam vents, three islands. He actually is playing 15 blue plus that one field of ruin, but 15 blue instead of 13. And that means that he's taking a definite hit on his his white mana. But he's also still playing like cleansing Nova for instance. So it's just like a greedier mana base to be sure. Well, I'm just uh, perusing over Terrence mana base and I would just note one thing. It looks to me like every land steam vents, uh, sorry for salt. Field of ruin is the only exception. Yeah. Can tap for either red or blue, Mm -hmm. um, which is maybe an important consideration if you've got a guy that's RRR you 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 in your list. Yep. So I think like that's kind of his limiting his limiting thing. Right. And maybe once you're playing Niv Mizzet Perun, you might as well play some Sinister Sabotages. I just I wonder, is cleansing Nova the wrong way? Yeah. Maybe that it, but like that's uh that occurred to me also but, 12, I mean, like, we're talking about a list that has four Clifftop Retreat, four Glacial Fortress, four Sacred Foundry, stop. 12 is just not a lot of white sources. Um, yeah, like, not for double something? white. Especially, like, Buzzing Nova is the kind of card you have to cast under pressure. Right. So, yeah, I, I'm skeptical of the mana base here, but it could, you know, maybe it's okay. I, uh, I... Yeah, it's okay, I guess. I just, I'm medium on it. Um, in in other blue decks, obviously, you know, Grixis is where, uh, you know, it's really popping. 
Grixis was uh, a lot of the Grixis decks were a lot like a lot of the base blue black decks where they're like Doom Whisperer decks where you're uh, I mean a lot of the blue black decks were just using Doom Whisperer anyway just because they just didn't have uh, enough victory conditions that were good and in particular there was a really really cool one that uh, that won one of the events um, uh, sorry not won one of the events but top uh, top 32, not top 16. Uh, Kyle Estes' uh, misinfor- disinformation campaign deck was so, you know, uh, a, a change of pace from the blue black uh, X decks we've been seeing. This is a true discard deck, you know, four uh, disinformation campaigns, along with four thought erasure and the eldest reborn. And you're just really going after somebody's hand. Did you think that maybe Niv Mizzet would be great? I'm not sorry, not Niv Mizzet. Um, excuse me, Nicol Bolas, the Ravager, uh, might make sense in this strategy. Totally, and in fact, that's the uh, a lot of the Grixis people. All they were doing is just basically adding Nicol Bolas to their Grixis deck. Like, uh, for instance, Jessup, who finished second, uh, he didn't play the disinformation campaign thing, but he was playing Nico Bolas as his only red card in his deck. His main deck had zero burn spells. He was using, like, everything from uh, Ritual of Soot, Moment of Craving, Fungal Infection, um, and uh, all in an effort to uh, stay true to his blue-black Roots, but just with Nico Bolas because Nico Bolas is so dope. Oh yeah, but like you could combine disinformation campaign and Nico Bolas; they do work together. They like work when you really sp- well together. Oh yeah, I think I'd even still play Doom Whisperer. You know, I'm I, looking at Kyle's, Kyle's deck though. This is like an expensive deck. Disinformation campaign costs three. Now I understand that with its surveil combos going on, this card can have a really, really substantial impact on the game. But it does cost three, and it's not really impacting the board very much. Um, he's got four copies of Doom Misper. I mean, I kind of love that. Uh, at the same time, this seems like a lot of cards that are not fast. You know, Eldest Reborn, not fast. Four Ritual of Soot buys you a lot of time, though. You know, the Smother Storm, just two black, black. Kill everything with uh, mana cost three or less. Sure. Uh, disinformation campaign is like a blue black probe. <laughs> if you ask me. Uh, yeah, I, I can imagine once you've got it going or once you've got two copies in play, uh, all of a sudden it, it is, uh, I don't even know, just crushing. Um, and then also very, very valuable for you. Maybe, maybe, maybe all this discard is good with dream meter and the dream meter is good enough under this context. You know, like, oh, their hand is empty. Now you bounce the best permanent and get them again with the disinformation campaign. And I'm not that there's, like, better options in straight blue block, but I just do not love Dream Eater. I, it's okay. I just think that you can do better. Yeah. I mean, maybe you have to, do, maybe you have to add a third color so you can pick up Nico Bolas or something. Or, like, the people who picked up green, you could add uh, Vraska, Vraska 6. Um, like, uh, Hunter Krotz. Soul Tide deck that was basically like the Grixis decks, but with uh, uh, Karn, Cyan of Urza, and Vraska Relic Seeker as they splash into the blue black deck. Uh, yeah, well, Vraska's a pretty awesome high end. Uh, also covers up a lot of the sins of, um, of the two color deck. Totally. Um, so what do you think about the Eldest Reborn as a main deck card? Love it. Love, love it, it and want more of it. I love it. I'm torn. I think there are some love decks it. that... I want some more of it. Yeah, I just can't wrap my head around, like, what if they're playing Togans? That's why there's four Ritual of Soot. All right. Um, so, yeah, I think that one of the things that's cool about this format is that there is enough space, at least currently, for kind of board control-based control decks that are just a bunch of 187 effects and two for ones and stuff like that. It reminds me a little bit of almost like Grixis energy. 
from the previous, you know, like from a year ago or whatever, in terms, not in, you know, the, the linear or whatever, but just in terms of being like, oh, I can just tap out and play some really great threats. And I've got a variety of just really good cards I can play that can start to generate me some card advantage. You know, that's actually similar to a thought that I had about Boros Angels. I look at Boros Angels, obviously the cards are better. In particular, the creatures are better than they were, you know, decades ago. But I feel like that deck is just like green, white, Urnum Geddon. Like, yeah, maybe it's the second or third best deck in the format, but it's like, here's a bunch of things that cost four or more. I hope I draw my land in the correct order. Right? Like, <laughs> yeah, is that, is that too mean to Boros? No. No, I don't think so. Um, there Usually, is- if the Boros decks start adopting your, your uh, treasure map uh, experimental frenzy oh. approach. Uh, there is a deck that I loved. I loved it with my heart. Yeah, which one is that? The mono blue? Uh, well, yeah, but that's not the one I was thinking of just right now. The <laughs> okay, Gold- sure. We- Golgari mid-range deck, top eight, uh, played by yep. Ian. Yeah, I, mean, I first, thought so. The first card in this list that you read is Burglar Rat. Like The second I saw that card, I'm like... This is a deck of quality. <laughs> well, particularly when you see the curve of Burglar Rat into District Guide or J Light Ranger into Golgari Fine Broker. Oh, yeah. This is a man who knows what he wants in the world. Like, <laughs> and Burglar oh, Rat yeah. is really, really tipping you off. Turn two, Burglar Rat or Merfolk Branchwalker. Turn three, District Guide or J Light Ranger. Turn four, Ravenous Chupacabra or Golgari Fine Broker. Just two for one, two for one, two for one. And all these decks are seeking to uh, really take advantage of find finality. And while Ian only has two copies, I think that it's very defensible to play four. Oh, yeah. I was actually even thinking, as much as I loved seeing Burglar Rat in this deck, maybe Seeker Squire would be better at the two just because it loads you up for these other effects. I mean, also with Zoni Thousand Eyed is taking advantage of very similar stuff um, as Fine Finality. Sure. It's, isn't it crazy? This thing has 27 creatures, and three of them are, are Thrashing Bronsonons, and it's only the Thrashing Bronsonons. So there's 24 creatures that are, that are generating like a 187 card advantage effect. Mm, sure yeah it's weird that standard is slow enough to accommodate that right now well maybe it is Play against these red decks uh well the thing is only burglar rat is explicitly bad against um goblin chain whirler right so even merfolk branch walker and jaylet ranger which are naturally two one creatures sometimes are big enough sure i mean not that they win in a fight but they're sometimes big enough um, yeah, I think this deck is just like, I, I hope that it remains viable going long. Cause it's just, I, I love it when magic is just like, oh, I played some good cards and they made sense together, you know, instead of, you know, just playing on some like really short term themes. Sure. Also, this deck has journey to eternity and, uh, <laughs> mad props. Yeah, we've already determined that's a uh, that's a one way ticket to sweetness. Bill. Oh yeah, I mean this is just once you start with Burglar Rat, you have already planted your flag. You want to plant your flag? Turn one, Island Miscloaked Herald. <laughs> two, turn two, like Merfolk Trickster or or uh, Night Vale Sprite. Oh, turn, the Night Vale Sprite. Jin. He's there. I don't. I don't know that I like the Nivel Sprite in this deck. Um, I like it because I always like that guy. Yeah, I don't know. It's just, are there really no other twos that we could play that hit a little harder? Yeah, he does not hit hard. Like that, the mono blue deck is not. It, it needs to kind of get a lead, you know, because it its cards are not really comparable to the cards in in a lot of the other strategies. Yeah, I mean, you've got. Tempest Jin, Wizard's Retort. Uh, 52 other cards. I guess 
that essence scatter maybe i don't know it's definitely not a deck for power no uh in fact i think it is on the very low end of power i mean i think tempest gin is really powerful right like if you've like they made that card super restrictive but if you have a shell that it makes it work it's going to be one of the most powerful cards um that said all the stuff around it is chain whirler fodder et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it is hard to want to walk face first into a chain whirler, but, uh, I think moving forward next week, I think we're going to see a rise of green, white. And I think mono red is going to continue to do well. Uh, I actually, the blue control decks will take a little bit of a dip. Still like them, but I think that they're going to have to collapse. They're going to have to. They're going to have to level up. I think each of the blue control decks we saw has a little bit of room to grow. Um, I think that the red decks doing well are going to. I I think that they're going to actually go ahead and adopt a little bit more of an experimental frenzy sort of schema. Um. I still, I don't know that we're pushing Experimental Frenzy as hard as we can. Oh, I do not I think we're with some, I want to experiment with some, like, dedicated Frenzy decks. So here's a question. Stuff like Chart of Course, even, you know? Um, Blue Red. I think Blue Red is where I would kind of be most interested in ending up. I could I could totally see that. Do you think Banefire is a good sideboard card? or you know, Probably not a main deck card, but a good sideboard card in, in dedicated Frenzy decks. It would depend on the rest of the deck. I mean, it can be. It's just you got to be careful because obviously it's a Nambu by itself. Oh, yeah. It's just not. It's weird, right? Like, it just doesn't go with the the uh, rest of the strategy. And then, like, if you draw it, you know, after you, you've gotten set up with a set of the records or something, then you can't even cast it. So it's it's just weird. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, but... On balance, I think Experimental Frenzy does mean you're going to play a lot more land. And then eventually your Bane Fires are going to do it a lot. Because when you play enough resources, there comes a point at which you might be like, okay, I just drew my second Bane, f- Bane Fire. Yeah. I can go ahead and just get rid of my Frenzy now. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to playing Experimental Frenzy. I think this card is awesome. Sweet. All right, man. We'll see you next week. All right. We'll back there. Cause in life didn't work so great. Tried to play dredge, it's a jailer hate. Ghostly prison waiting for my untapped phase. Your core I trapped in amber.